Okay. Good morning, everybody, and the recording. Sorry. Good morning, everybody, and um, uh, welcome for this uh, new colloquium in the Instituto de Astrofisica de Andalucía in Granada, in Spain. Uh, and today we will have uh, the talk by Professor Bosena uh, Cherny from the University in, in Warsaw and um, from the Center of Theoretical Physics in Warsaw, sorry. And she will talk about the old and new problems with active galactic nuclei and AGN applications to cosmology. Uh, Professor Cherny will be introduced by um, Isabel Marquez. Please, Isabel. Thank you, Rene. Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for being again here for, for this uh, second uh, colloquium, uh, we're, we're colloquium in, in AGM this week. That's a great pleasure for us to have, uh, of course, here uh, uh, Professor Bozena Cherny. Uh, thank you very much, Bozena, for having accepted our invitation. And thank you all for being here. Um, Bozena Cherny is a full professor at the Center of the Theoretical Physics uh, in Warsaw since uh, 2015. Prior to this period, she was employed by the, the Copernicus Astronomical Center in Poland as well, where she progressed in her career through PhD in 84 uh, to a title professor in 86. On, on her leave of absence, she spent four years abroad at Harvard, uh, Harvard at Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics in the United States, and then in, in, for two years in, um, in the Department of Astronomy in Leicester University, United Kingdom. She uh, was active in, and she's still active in the Polish uh, funding and, uh, agency, National Science Center, as a board uh, member. Her fields of interest are uh, bas basically astrophysics, cosmology, dark energy, and active galactic nuclei, and accretion processes. She has published about uh, uh, almost 400 papers in this field, with a total citations of more than 7,000, with an age of, uh, of about uh, 46 or very close to 50. She has also supervised the nine uh, PhD students and she mostly develops theory but in, di in direct, always in direct application to uh, astronomical data. Uh, currently, she leads the project uh, constraints on the properties of uh, dark energy from active galactic nuclei and she's also a member of the AGN working group in the international project Large Synaptic Sky Telescope, the LSST. And since the 2011, she's editor of the American Astronomical Society journals, including the Astrophysical Journal. Uh, today, as an says, uh, she's talking about uh, all the new problems with active galactic nuclei and AGN application to cosmology. Um, I insist on my acknowledgement for having here uh, uh, Professor Bazena, and the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much for, for the uh, invitation. I'm happy to, to, to share my my talk with, with you, I deeply apologize that I didn't really come in person, but somehow it was too complicated to arrange for the travel. So I will try to share the screen. Now it's not working. I'm sorry why it's that. Same problem as before. You need to share the full des desktop. But I think I did that. Oh. Now, now. Yeah. Now I had to press one more time because the, my laptop is kind of lazy. I apologize. So perhaps I, I, I change the talk a, a bit, although I will speak about the cosmology at the very, very end, but uh, I was afraid that if I cover too broad uh, range of topics, then um, perhaps the, the most important aspects will be lost. So I will be mostly talking about modeling broad emission lines in active galactic nuclei, 
But at the very end of the talk, I will uh, speak about uh, applications to cosmology, which are now my favorite topic and particularly the topic to be done for ERC uh, project. So, of course, uh, as we know, quasars were discovered uh, uh, over 60 years ago now. Uh, but the true, true nature of, of quasars was, was revealed in 1963. And it was due to uh, three aspects. First, the important thing was to pr precisely measure the a position of the source we see 273 on the sky due to moon occultation. And then it was possible to identify uh, the source on the optical sky and measure and take the spectrum. And then the spectrum didn't really look like anything you expect from the star. And the lines there did not correspond to anything in the comparison spectrum. And it was really great idea of Martin Schmidt when he realized that what we see or he saw there are actually Balmer lines only shifted. And this is how the idea of, of quasars and their cosmological distances uh, started. And broad emission lines, those Barmer lines, were actually key in um, identification of the nature of uh, quasars. So quasars are now recognized as just uh, a subclass of active galactic nuclei, uh, some types of active galactic nuclei were discovered much, uh, much earlier. Uh, for example, Seifert galaxies were already uh, studied by Carl Seifert in the 40s. Uh, BL lag was discovered over 100 years ago, but misclassified. So we have a variety of AGN and they share a common property. All of them contain the supermassive black hole and some surrounding medium which accretes onto it. Otherwise, we wouldn't see any signal because the signal must come from accreting uh, material. So the best studied case is uh, the black hole in the center of our galaxy, which we call uh, uh, Sagittarius A star. And recently it was possible to uh, get the image of this in millimeter band due to uh, event horizon telescope uh, action. But uh, sources like Sagittarius A star, they do not have broad emission lines. So not all AGNs really do have broad emission lines in their spectra. So indeed, we have a, quite a zoo of, uh, of uh, active uh, galaxies. Uh, for example, only a small fraction of uh, galaxies have strong uh, jets, only about 10%. Uh, 3C273 has uh, a clear jet. Uh, again, only a fraction show broad emission lines, but 3C273 is one of those. And you can see here broad emission line, uh, HB or Balmer lines are actually broad. But then those broad lines uh, uh, are either really very broad, like a few hundred kilometers per second, uh, or just broadish, only a few hundred kilometers per second. And a fraction of ciphered galaxies and very few quasars, they show only those narrower uh, lines. And very narrow lines are and low ionization lines are typical for liners. So not all AGNs have those broad and strong emission uh, lines. 
So one, one step towards unification and understanding why some sources have broad lines and some sources do not, and then they are classified as Seifert II galaxies, came from this old work of Antonucci and Miller, 1985, when they took a spectrum in polarized light of the source, which didn't normally in, in normal light show broad H beta line, but in polarized light, you see quite clearly this H beta broad line. And they realized that from this point of view, all sources show have broad emission lines, only sometimes we do not see that because the central part is shielded by the dusty molecular torus. So if we see, uh, if we have a clear view of the, of the nucleus, we should see broad emission lines. But if the view line of sight is shielded by the torus, we can see broad lines only in the scattered radiation, which also uh, introduces polarization. So from that point of view, it looked like we have a universal picture and all AGNs consist of a, a supermassive black hole and a creation disk, and then uh, you have clouds. Uh, darker dots here represent uh, broad line region clouds and white bigger thing represents uh, narrow line uh, region. And you have this uh, obscuring torus, which I mentioned before, and this jet, which may or may not be present. But uh, this is not uh, the whole classification uh, story. Because as I told you, Sagittarius A star does not look like that. So fainter sources do not really follow that kind of a scheme. Because if you go towards lower and lower accretion rates for the same uh, value of the central black hole, then in the innermost part, the standard Shakura Sunyayev disk is replaced with a hot flow. Uh, usually modeled as ADAF or advection dominated accretion flow. And if this accretion, if this ADAF flow is very extended, then uh, broad line region clouds are not there, which hints already that the formation of the broad emission lines must be related to the standard called accretion disk. So if we summarize requirements which uh, must be satisfied to get broad emission lines, we have several of them, three are keys. First, we must have irradiating flux, but that is simple. It must come from the central uh, parts, the region very close to the black hole. It can be in the form of X-rays as well. And it's easily uh, produced there because the dissipation is the strongest where the gravity, gravitational well is the, the deepest. Then the second requirement is the material must be quite dense uh, in order to keep the temperature at 10 to 4 kelvins. And it's not so easy because this material may, must be located at few hundred or few thousand gravitational radii to produce the requested width of the, of the lines because the, the width of the lines, of course, come from the Doppler motion. So if the material is not dense enough, the temperature will be higher. And for example, in Sagittarius A star, the temperature of the surrounding material is always 10 to 7, and this is not the broad line region. So uh, the region which uh, satisfies this, those uh, conditions which I, I formulated, we name it broad line region. But that does not solve the problem how this region really develops, how it forms, what it really is. So if we look uh, at uh, objects which are which have very low accretion rates but not as low as Sagittarius A star, 
we see something interesting. We see Balmer lines, which are clearly double peak and a little asymmetric, actually. This is an old example of ARP 102B from Chen and Halpern. Uh, from the paper 1989, and uh, such a line was well modeled just by irradiated accretion disk. So you didn't need any cloud, any something mysterious, just an irradiated accretion disk. Uh, extended between uh, 350 uh, RG gravitational radiant 100 with viewing angle 34 degrees irradiated, of course. But they had also to add additional velocity dispersion on the top of the Keplerian speed, which was not explained uh, and in this model, but it was required by the data. So irradiating disk is quite quite attractive for the low accretion rate uh, objects. And why this uh, thin disk can be so well irradiated? Because in those sources, as I mentioned, the inner disk is replaced with a hot ADAF, which is geometrically thick. And then the irradiation of the thin outer disk is quite easy. And then the Keplerian motion it creates a double peak uh, line profile. But we should explain the velocity dispersion. And in addition, these double peak lines are actually very rare in, in, in objects. Most objects have single peak lines. So here you see a collection of objects from uh, Illich et al. 2015 review. And only second, this red one, is the object I showed you. All the other or blue things, they, they have uh, single peak uh, um, lines, so they cannot be identified with just irradiated uh, uh, cold accretion disk. So then if you think about the uh, disk surface, then the next idea is, of course, to have a wind from the disk surface. And that uh, was already an idea developed in 1995, quite in some details, by Murray and Chang and collaborators. They proposed line-driven wind as a model for the broadline region. And they, they obtained uh, line profiles from such model. But those uh, line profiles, profiles were uh, usually somewhat asymmetric, and uh, this asymmetry was expected because of the fast outflow of the wind. And that was uh, interestingly in agreement with uh, emission lines like carbon-4, which frequently shows a strong asymmetry, particularly at high accretion rates, but uh, Balmer lines are not so symmetric. And this is why we developed another model. And our model is based uh, on this idea that if we look at an accretion disk and the surface temperature, then the temperature goes down with the radius. So at some uh, distance, finally, the temperature of the disk is lower than the dust sublimation temperature, and the dust must form there in the disk atmosphere. And then the wind can be pushed up by the pressure, radiation pressure acting on dust and not line driven wind, which would form at smaller rate. And then if such cloud uh, is pushed uh, up from the disk surface, then it is better exposed to irradiation by the central part. Then the dust evaporates and then the cloud will fall back. And in this way, we introduced uh, um, a wind which is actually a failed wind. And we proposed that for the formation of Balmer lines, not carbon-4, but Balmer lines. And this region is 
closer to the uh, black hole than the dusty molecular torus because torus exists where even irradiation, full irradiation by the, by the central part does not lead, lead to this uh, uh, evapor to, to dust evaporation. So our idea actually came not from pure theory, but uh, it was motivated partially by observations because we uh, noticed that when you uh, measure the time delay of the line, you can produce radius luminosity dependence, which is uh, uh, with the power of square root of the of the monochromatic luminosity, monochromatic but not bolometric luminosity, and then from the standard theory of accretion disk, we know that this monochromatic luminosity depends both on mass and accretion rate, but also local effective temperature depends not individually on mass or accretion rate, but on the product so and on the radius so. If we knew all those uh, proportionality coefficients, this from observations, the first one from observation and the uh, two other from the theory, we calculated the effective temperature implied by the observations and we got the value 1000 kelvins, which corresponds to the dust sublimation temperature. And this is uh, how we developed actually our model. So our model is consistent with the fact that uh, H beta uh, line uh, is located closer to the nucleus than the dusty torus. Here you see uh, radius measurements from the, the time delays and blue points represent uh, H beta line as a function of monochromatic luminosity, while um, uh, points, uh, red points represent the dusty torus, which is by some factor five uh, farther away consistently. So we later slowly developed our model of the broad line region. We included uh, um, more precise uh, computations of the radiation pressure acting on dust. And then we had to introduce some shielding effects, which uh, led to the fact that the time delay, predicted time delay or the location of the broad line region uh, started to depend slightly on the accretion rate as well, and not only on the luminosity, monochromatic luminosity. And this is how we got the delay in the form of a belt and not a single line, which is quite consistent um, with what we see in the, in the data. And during the last two years, we started to develop uh, really this model uh, pushing it uh, forward. Still, the model is not a hydrodynamical model. We assume a cloud, and then for a single cloud, which is located at the disk surface at the beginning, for the single cloud, we calculate the radiation pressure acting on, on that, on the dusty uh, cloud. Only dust is included, but then this radiation pressure is calculated, taking into account a range of dust grain sizes, types of uh, dust uh, grains, and radiation pressure as seen from the whole disk. So under this, and the height of the disk was also calculated from the model. So the cloud starts its motion, and if it is close to the uh, really onset of the brown line region, then the cloud on uh, uh, on their motion is well irradiated by the nucleus. And in that case, we calculated the, the temperature of the cloud. It became above the sublimation temperature. So at that point, we assumed that there is no further radiation pressure acting because there is no dust support. And the cloud performs only a 
a ballistic motion. So it falls back on the disk, but then it's a dustless cloud. That cloud which starts at uh, farther out, it is it remains dusty all the time. But it also fails to escape, so it goes uh, down. So we calculated this kind of motion for a range of temperatures, uh, for the uh, range of black hole mass accretion rates, and actually metallicity. And that was really quite uh, surprising for us, particularly this dependence on metallicity. Because when we calculated the motion of the clouds for, for the black hole mass 10 to 8, for the Eddington ratio 1%, and only solar metallicity, the clouds were, at each radius, they were just jumping above the surface. It's very nice because this creates the requested uh, dispersion of the velocity which was wanted for the irradiated disk model. Uh, on the other hand, when we took larger black hole mass, 10 to 9, much higher uh, accretion rates, Eddington accretion rate, and then velocity and then metallicity 5, we realized that significant fraction of clouds which start their motion at the inner edge of the broad line region, they become easily dustless, but they are accelerated so strongly that they form an outflow. So then it's not a failed wind any longer. We still have a failed wind at larger radii. But the inner, at the innermost uh, uh, edge of the broad line region, we have a stream of outflowing material. Of course, this is a stream in cross section, but in three dimensions, this is something like uh, an outflow cone. And I stress, this is really calculated in our model uh, my student Mohamed Nadav was the leading person in those computations. And then this picture actually compares nicely with what was proposed by Martin Elvis already in the year 2000. Only so he, he drew actually both this cross section, which we now see in the model. And this is a nice 3D illustration of what is happening. And the distance he proposed uh, uh, for this outflowing stream is quite consistent with what we now have in our computations, because our, our model is calculated. And the, in our model, the position of this stream only depends on those parameters, global parameters, and to some extent, the dust sublimation temperature, which we always assume mm, 1500 kelvins in, in our simulations uh, so far. So it's quite interesting that this kind of thing was already proposed earlier at the basis of some other observational arguments. And it's also quite interesting that nowadays dusty torus, which I showed in the form of a strange structure, now it is uh, considered as first clumpy thing, and second, also in the form of this conical outflow with eventually something in the equatorial plane, but with conical outflow. And this is the picture proposed by Sebastian Hennig in his review 2019. And it is based on his infrared and submillimeter uh, mapping of uh, nearby uh, objects. There is still a difference between our picture, our conical outflow and his conical outflow, because his conical outflow starts at uh, uh, one to parsecs, while our outflow starts as a small fraction of a parsec. So it's a good question whether really 
he cannot differentiate between those two conical outflows when when mapping or we actually see two nested things one in the other like i don't know chandra mirror for example when you have nested mirrors one in the other of course, more, more studies, both of time delays and uh, direct imaging uh, will help to establish exactly what is, what is happening. And in this case, this is not really modeling of the dusty outflow. This is a heuristic model based on, on maps. So recently, we also it tried to predict the shape of the emission lines from our model, and Mohammed did such uh, computations. Uh, so far, he only compared his uh, predictions of the model with the mean quasar spectrum. So he took the mean quasar spectrum, a composite spectrum, he subtracted uh, narrow uh, H-beta line and uh, oxygen line from the, from the shape. And what was uh, marked here is, is in blue, is marked on the right-hand side diagram, in, also in blue. And in green, he marks the histogram, which he numerically obtained assuming the mean value of the black hole mass and at mean value of the Eddington rate uh, for this uh, sample, which was used to get the quasar composite spectrum. And then additionally, he assumed 30 degrees for the viewing angle and the metallicity five, five times solar. So I think the agreement is, uh, is quite good. The, the red uh, line here is just the smoothest version of the, of the profile, but the histogram is the actual version which he obtained from, from computations. I think the model is surprisingly in agreement because we do not have any additional parameters like the location of the broad line region or the distribution of the clouds or what. Everything is calculated from this, uh, from his model. So additional arguments that uh, I think we are on the on the right track with this idea is uh, looking at the accretion uh, disk as a sequence of stellar of uh, stellar atmospheres. So we, since the temperature of the disk goes down, we could say that uh, the, the range of the temperatures is, corresponds to O, B, A, whatever uh, main sequence stars. But uh, uh, and this, this idea was already used by Kowe Hauf and Sunyaev in 1984 to construct realistic accretion disk spectra. But, of course, you shouldn't necessarily use main sequence stars because actually the stellar uh, atmosphere model depends both on the effective temperature, but also and significantly on surface gravity. So I did an exercise. I, I calculated the surface gravity um, uh, as a function of effective temperature for an accretion disk with mass 10 to 8 solar masses and for two values of the accretion rate or Eddington ratio. One is uh, uh, Eddington ratio, the other one is 1% uh, Eddington ratio, and those are those two continuous lines. They are not that widely different, actually. And then the hot part of the disk it can be identified uh, with OB stars if we would take into account surface gravity and this effective temperature. But more distant regions uh, correspond to post HGB stars. Uh, main sequence stars would be well off. Uh, and finally, at the location where the dust uh, sublimation temperature is uh, 1000 uh, uh, kelvins, right, logarithm three, there AGB 
enveloped uh, fits the, the picture and actually those two points correspond to a single envelope because the structure of the AGB envelope is quite complex. This is the cross section taken from all this paper, but I think it does not matter. Uh, you have a star, then you have dusty uh, acceleration zone, and then you have colder dust and uh, zone expands the, the dusty wind uh, uh, outflow. So this is uh, how the uh, AGB uh, star looks like, and probably the, the atmosphere of the accretion disk also looks like that. But that points out towards two important things which are not yet included in our mm, uh, uh, model. Uh, namely, here in AGB star, the dust actually forms in the yellow ridge in this expanding envelope. So finally, the model should include the chemical evolution of the material, which is very complicated. And then the wind is partially optically thick and starts as a continuous wind with the clumpiness developing later on. So this is not yet included in our model. So a lot is still to do with modeling of this uh, outflow and the broad line region. But I would like to finish my talk with uh, attempt to use uh, quas quasars for cosmology, even now, not waiting for solving all the problems. And the basic idea, of course, there are several methods how to use quasars for cosmology, but we think about the Broadland region and the measurement of its size with, uh, uh, by measuring time delay of emission lines, then the idea is simple. Uh, from our model, for example, we see a radius luminosity relation without any arbitrary coefficient. So the slope is 0.5 for the absolute luminosity and the constant is fixed by the dust sublimation temperature. And so if you measure the position of the uh, distance, the radius from time delay, then you measure the absolute luminosity. If you measure the absolute luminosity of the source, you can easily measure the luminosity distance because then it's very easy to measure the observed flux and you calculate the square root of those two. So in principle, the method is very, very simple. Uh, in practice, since the region is extended, we are not yet brave enough to use this first formula, but you, what we rather use the more general formula, as was already proposed by Watson uh, et al. and Haas uh, et al. in 2011. And this formula uh, combining the time delay of a line uh, with the luminosity contains two arbitrary parameters. So in our studies, we use time delays measured mostly uh, by other groups. We have only three uh, time delays of for magnesium two, which come from our own reverberation monitoring of uh, uh, salt uh, of, of quasars with uh, salt with Southern African telescope. And this is the picture from my recent review, but it is based on a number of uh, uh, publications in, in quite large uh, collaboration uh, now. And it uh, shows the luminosity distance, the Hubble diagram, luminosity distance versus redshift for several uh, quasar samples and several emission lines. So uh, blue is carbon-4 emission line time delays, red is magnesium-2 time delays, and H-beta 
a sample was divided into low Eddington uh, rate sample and high Eddington rate sample. And HBT are not so well working with uh, for, for cosmology. We, we don't know yet. Uh, why there are problems with uh, with those samples maybe they come from too many groups too many people using too many different methods of measuring time delay but uh, carbon 4 and magnesium 2 they they work quite quite well and so far we do not claim any significant tension with the standard uh, cosmology Of course, as, as I mentioned, there are many other methods to use uh, quasars for cosmology. So I, I only uh, shortly mention uh, another method, uh, which is based on selecting extreme Eddington ratio emitters. And uh, similar picture here from uh, several samples come from my uh, recent uh, review, but here in, in the case of this uh, method, key people are Mary Lolly, Martinez Aldama, and Paola Marziani. So if you would have any questions about that, I would not be able to answer. So coming to, to the summary. In general, modeling these queens require much more work than it was done so far. So there was a considerable progress in line driving uh, uh, winds, uh, for example, the group of uh, Daniel Proga and collaborators, but that should be combined with dust driving including dust evaporation. This is not done and it should be done in the future. Of course, uh, radiative transfer should be solved uh, in such a complex model. And in our model, we do not solve for the radiative transfer at all yet. Then the model predictions should be tested against line shape and the measured uh, time delays. And of course, we will have a lot of data for that, particularly in the future, because there is a lot of measurements still coming on from many groups from, for example, as the SS reverberation uh, monitoring of this group. And then we have expected uh, results from Vera Rubin Observatory uh, in the form of uh, LSST. So in the future, there will be a lot of data. So it's worth uh, pushing the theory forwards. And thank you for, for attention and I apologize once more for not being there in, in person. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Czerny, for this wonderful talk. So now the talk is open for questions. Please uh, raise your hand, your electronic hand, and Sarah uh, will take uh, care of the session. So Sarah, all yours. Okay. Uh, so while you are uh, you are thinking, because I don't see any hands uh, up, I will thank again uh, Bodena for this nice. Talk. I think he's, uh, I'm an observational uh, astronomer, so it's quite useful to have such a uh, kind of uh, profile uh, to talk, uh, to learn from you, so we can complement uh, observation with uh, theory. So, Isabel, uh, please uh, ask your question. Okay, thank you, Sarah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Bazena, for such a nice talk. Um, I'd like to ask you something concerning liners, because some of them show um, somewhat broad lines. So uh, it's a minority, as, uh, as always, but they, they show broad lines with uh, around several thousand, uh, between 1,000 and 3,000, let's say, kilometers per second. So um, is it possible that even if their accretion, accretion rates are as, as low, that they do have the broad line region? Or is it, it may be a different explanation for that? 
that's a very good topic because what I said is the popular knowledge that the inner uh, ADA flow always replaces the cold disk when we go down with the Eddington ratio. But I'm aware of one object, absolutely puzzling object, which was found by Stefano Bianchi. That is a secret galaxy, which, galaxy, which was firmly classified as Cipher 2 galaxy. And then as a result, uh, but it, it has 10 to minus 5 Eddington ratio, so a very, very low ratio. And as a result of his discussion with uh, Ski Antonucci, they went to Hubble Space Telescope and they got the spectrum. The black hole mass there is small, so with, with ground-based uh, observations, they, they couldn't get anything. But in a Hubble Space Telescope, they saw H-beta line, very broad uh, at a distance of something like 70 RG, relativistically distorted. So apparently somehow it is possible that the cold disk survives and the inner hot flow does not overtake. Mm -hmm. But this is the only thing which really has a proven cold disk while having 10 to minus five or so Eddington ratio. So it is like liners, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Mm. Okay, so thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Maria Caballero Garcia, you are the next. Yes, I got an, a question. Thank you, Bochena, for the interesting talk. So I was wondering about the relationship between the lag as measured uh, in the optical and the, and the velocity of the outflow, if there is any relation between both uh, and you can express it. Uh, good question. We, we didn't think about uh, doing that. Observationally, of course, the, 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 the outflow velocity is uh, well studied in carbon four lines, but then it is, it is measured against uh, um, Eddington ratio, not time delays. Mm -hmm. in, the, in, in, in the model, we didn't try to, 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 to do that. So I'm not aware of this kind of plots. Mm -hmm. It's a really interesting question. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Pepa, please ask your question. Thank you, Bocena, for this very helpful talk. I was uh, wondering uh, how do you explain, how do you manage to explain so complicated problem in so easy way? So I was fascinated about your about your talk and I will uh, look to the talk again because uh, I, I the the few times I have entered into this topic, I found this very complicated. How do you explain the variation of the lines and all these things? Um, so I, 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 I I'm like. Uh, I think there was like a disconnection, right? Okay. So I, I, I like uh, to know your opinion in this uh, new topic uh, that is arising from many different. Uh, wavelength is the the question of the changing look, the changing look object, because uh, some of them uh, uh, lose the broad region and become ten year later for two, and then go back uh, after some few years to a uh, uh, question like. Uh, like a spectra, so that is uh, so. This is something that is happening between the within the 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 broad light region. So that uh, so I would like to know, to know your opinion on that. Mm -hmm. 
that is a finish, very interesting topic for me. Yes, I, I think for, first of all, that those changing look agents may not all be exactly of the same mechanism. That's first warning, and this is probably why we need uh, many more data and preliminary classification of those things. But in many cases, I, I, I'm quite convinced that uh, Indeed, some uh, dramatic change happens in the innermost part of the of the flow. Uh, I don't think that the broadline region is uh, rearranged immediately because that takes more time. On the other hand, if you stop illuminating the broadline region, you stop seeing broad lines. And the thermal time scale or ionization time scale in the broad line region is quite short. So if you switch off irradiation, you will not see that. It's like, you know, in the, in the darkness, if you have a torque, you can see the table, you switch off the torque, the table is still there, but you do not see it. So I, 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 I think that those changes must be happening in the flow close to the very close to the black hole directly because there the time scales are the fastest. We tried to model that with radiation pressure instability, but I'm not absolutely saying that this is the, the, the only solution. There may be uh, some processes uh, involving a magnetic field, rearrangement of the direction of the magnetic field in the disk. This is what Begelman produces. Then if, if we have this TD event interacting or TD star, whatever, falling into the disk and perturbing the disk flow very close at 10 RG, 20 RG. This will again change the, 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 the flow and this will change the, the, the broad line region. So probably the material is there, but it's not illuminated for some time or it becomes illuminated after some period. For, for changing, for changing, you know, because the, 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 the flow up and down, it's kind What's happening? So I'm just slow. Sorry, can you repeat the two last sentences because the connection was interrupted at least in my office? Okay. Uh, I think that the motion of the clouds uh, take more time, particularly the motion up in in, in uh, our FRADO model because the velocity then is not so fast. So I think that this, uh, we do not have the rearrangement of the uh, broad line region by themselves, but we lose the torque which irradiates or we induce the torque which irradiates. So this is a kind of illusion. Probably, that's so my opinion. That, in that case, uh, do you think that uh, that uh, after the look, uh, when the illumination start on and rain, uh, the the broadline region should go to the previous stage exactly? Oh, sorry for that. That was <laughs> for me my my watch <laughs> mm, reminded to finish the talk. Um, well, yes, I think in 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 few hundred years, the, 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 well, it depends also on the black hole mass, but the broad line region finally also may evolve, but it's slower. Uh, so yeah. normally, I I would quite expect uh, uh, events on and off, if if those changes in the, in the nucleus continue. So for example, if it is due to radiation pressure instability or magnetic field uh, flipping, that should repeat a couple of times. Why not? On the other hand, if it was just TDE and the flow was perturbed, then probably it will not repeat itself. So it will be, it will enter into 
different state and then it will return to the previous state and it will be it. It will not repeat. No, it looks uh, very interesting. Thank you. But is there a connection with the AGNGT cycle? So it is due to the uh, problem region, the illumination and the activity of the AGN. If there could be a connection with this and could be a way to uh, understand the uh, changing look uh, behavior? Well, if, 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 in those objects where this kind of event repeats, then yes, we should uh, look at, uh, at some uh, limit cycle. But I think it's not clear that in all uh, changing looks, uh, look AGNs, it, re it repeats. So this is why I said probably there are different types of, of events. But in those which this thing repeats, yes, we should look at the limit cycle. On the other hand, we, we did some modeling and we can get short time scale, like few years, several years only, if we postulate that the size of the disk is relatively small, like 100 RG, due to whatever reason. Because if you have longer, uh, a larger disk, like you normally expect, then you predict the limit cycle, but that it will last 10 to 5 years, 10 to 4, 10 to 5 years. Then it's eventually consistent with some limit cycle, with some duty cycle estimates based on radio, for example, on, on sizes of radio structures, whatever. On the other hand, those estimates from radio structures are not 100% guaranteeing the, the time scales because there are two possibilities. The size of the radio source is short because the radio source is young, or the size is short because the jet got frustrated, as they called. It got stuck there. And then the source may, may be uh, uh, old, but just didn't grow up. Me, myself, I'm very short and not because I'm young, but because, and not because I'm old, but I just stopped growing, you know? Okay. So it's not clear. It's not clear. We still need also more studies of this aspect in, in, in radio uh, maps. Okay. Thank you. So uh, uh, in the chat, I don't see any question. René, in YouTube, do you see any? Sorry, no question in the chat of uh, YouTube. So I would like to ask uh, the last question myself and actually the wish. So we conclude with uh, a nice thing. So as I mentioned earlier, I'm more uh, in the observations. So if uh, you can make a wish uh, to an observational astronomer, what what who do you ask to an observation astronomer from the theoretical point of view to uh, really observe what you really need the most? Oh, this is very very difficult question for me because I I usually consent to what is possible. So I'm quite happy with what I'm getting. So in, in that case, my wish would be, um, I would like to have all LSST data, which is expected in 10, 10 years now, right? Okay. <laughs> Otherwise I will retire before the <laughs> project is completed. It's tricky, but uh, we will try to have uh, LSST data as fast as possible and enjoy them. And uh, meanwhile, we actually learn from you and your model. So uh, no more questions. Many thanks again for the talk. And uh, we, we will be happy to have you here in the near future. Thank you very much. And thank you all for attending the talk. Yeah. Yes, thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs> thank you. Bye. 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 Thanks so thank much. You. Bye bye. Thank you, Lucena. It has been really a wonderful talk. <laughs>